This lecture will cover a wide variety of ophthalmic conditions that can commonly be seen in the community care arena for proper management, referral, and treatment by pharmacists. Objectives for today's lecture include to identify common ophthalmic conditions that can be treated and managed with self-care, keep it in mind to always be more on the conservative side with referral recommendations as it is related to ophthalmic care, to describe which patients need referral for ophthalmic conditions, demonstrate proper counseling regarding the use of ophthalmic drops and ointments, recommend proper pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatment options for common ophthalmic conditions, and to describe basic contact lens care for patients. References can be found here. First, we'll start with an overview of what topics will be covered in this lecture. There is a large variety of conditions that we will cover in this lecture, and it may seem like we're kind of moving through them quickly, but the basic two conditions that you will see and have proper recommendations for eye care in the community setting are going to be dry eye and allergic conjunctivitis. Many of the other conditions you can make non-pharmacologic recommendations for or minor pharmacologic recommendations for but those are generally more severe conditions that you will need to refer a patient to an eye care provider for. First, I wanted to start with a brief overview of the eye and the structure of the eye and natural mechanisms of defense that the eye has in caring for itself. So the eye, because it does have a lot of mucosal tissue involved, is susceptible to both environmental and microbiologic contamination, that being both bacterial and viral infection. However, the eye does have many natural defense mechanisms to help care for itself and prevent damage. The greatest and most major component of this natural defense mechanism is the eyelid. And the eyelid is a multi-layer tissue that has an external skin covering to protect itself but also has an internal conjunctival tissue layer, and that is the layer of skin that covers the sclera, or white part of the eye, to help remove these foreign bodies and help protect the eye. It primarily protects the anterior surface of the eye, and another component of natural defense that the eye has are tears, and tears are first produced by glandular tissue and then start to move over the ocular surface, surface headed towards the nose, and then into drainage canals located in both the upper and the lower eyelids. And these tears help to keep the ocular surface lubricated, they provide a mechanism for removing debris, and they also have potent antimicrobial benefits. And those are provided by specific enzymes within the tears, as well as immunoglobulin A that can be found in tears. Once those eyes pass over the ocular surface, as I mentioned, they're then forced into the drainage canals, and those two canals converge to form the lacrimal sac, and that's where lacrimal occlusion comes from, if you've ever heard that term, regarding to um, the use of eye drops. And that lacrimal sac is between the inner eyelid and the nose, and this is a highly vascular tissue area, and because of having a lot of vasculature, it's very susceptible to systemic um, absorption of the drug, and that's where your potential systemic side effects of topically administered eye medications come from. And so that's why lacrimal occlusion, which we'll talk about in the next slide, is so important and is such an important counseling point for patients who are using eye medications. So we're going to briefly review a general administration of eye products, and this will apply both to the RX medications that you'll learn about later in therapeutics as well as the OTC medications that we're going to talk about. First, we'll talk about the administration of eye drops, and then we'll talk about the administration of an eye ointment. Overall, it's a very similar approach and process with key components that are pretty much the same, but there's a few unique counseling points that differ between eye drops and eye ointments. So first, for an eye drop, you want to counsel the patient to tilt their head back, and before you even get to the tilting the head back, you always want to make sure that the patient has washed their hands. That's one of the most important things to prevent eye infection or further infection of the eye, depending on the ophthalmic condition that the patient currently has. So first, as I mentioned, they're going to tilt the head back. Then they'll grasp 
the lower lid of their eyelid gently right below their eyelashes and then they want to pull that eyelid away to create a pouch and that is where the eye drop will eventually fall into. They will then place the dropper directly over their eye and they do that by looking at it directly. However, you want to make sure that the patient never touches the dropper actually to their eye or to the eyelid. You want it to look just as it does in the picture. Right before the patient applies a drop, you want to instruct them to look up and that will help the eye drop fall down the ocular surface appropriately and then get into that pocket that they've created. And you want your patient to apply a single drop at a time. After they've applied a single drop, you want them to release the eye slowly, but release it as soon as they drop that eye drop into the eye. And then you want to counsel them to close their eyes gently for about three minutes. And commonly the best way to do that is to place the patient's head or to have the patient place their head down as though they're looking at the floor and that uses gravity to help pull the drop and in medication into the cornea for most effective treatment. The patient wants to minimize blinking or squeezing of the eyelid during that time period and then following the three minutes they want to blot excessive solution around the eye or if they're applying multiple drops at a time, that is when you would have them apply an eye drop, but never more than one eye drop at a single time. For eye ointments, you're going to start the same way, so patients are going to wash their hands before getting the eye product out. They'll then tilt their head back and again grasp the lower eyelid right below the eyelashes and pull away from the eye to form a pouch. They will then place the ointment tube over the eye, again looking directly at that ointment tube, and again making sure that they avoid touching the eye or any tissue surface to prevent any sort of infection. And then using a slow sweeping motion, you want to instruct the patient to place a fourth to a half an inch of ointment inside the lower eyelid. And I've had a lot of patients who have really struggled with that before and they don't know how to place a fourth of an inch to a half an inch, how do they measure that, and how do they know that's accurate. And what I simply play, I instruct the patient is try and get a visual if they have a ruler at home so they know how much that looks like. But generally it's just a small amount. They don't want to put a long strip of the ointment in their eye because they're going to have a lot of blurred vision and it's going to be more medication than they truly need. So just a small um, strip of that eye ointment into their eye. Again, they're going to release the eyelid slowly and then gently close their eyes for about one to two minutes to allow that ointment to absorb into the eye. And then blot the excessive ointment from the eye again, similar to our eye drops. The more important counseling point that's unique for this eye ointment compared to the eye drops is ointments have some sort of an ointment base in them, obviously, to make them an ointment. And a common side effect from it having an ointment base is it takes the ointment a little bit longer to dissolve into the eye and to be absorbed into the eye than an eye drop. And so blurred vision can be commonly um, anticipated with these medications. And so it's always important to make sure the patient's aware of that so that they, one, know it's going to occur and don't get alarmed by it, but two, also can plan to administer that ointment according to a time that is convenient for them that blurred vision isn't going to be an issue. So some general counseling points that I want to cover for both our eye ointments and our eye drops is to always check the expiration date. You never want to put an expired product into your eye. And most products, once they're opened, even if that expiration date is two, three years down the road, once they're open, they have an expiration date of 30 days because of that um, preservative that's in them can only guarantee about 20 to 30 days of sterility once it's opened. Washing the hands thoroughly is very important as we discussed. And then contact lenses should be removed unless the product specifically states to administer while contacts are in the eyes. And then generally you want to leave the contacts out for about at least 15 minutes after administering the eye product to allow it to properly absorb into the eye. For eye suspensions, you never want to refrigerate that. So always check for an eye drop, whether it's a solution or suspension. And suspensions also need to be shaken well before placing into the eye. And then you want to place a suspension last of multiple medications that a patient may need to administer, especially if they're having an eye surgery or some type of eye procedure. And you place the suspension last 
because it has a prolonged retention time in the tear film. So if you put that in first and then you put your other eye drops in, you kind of mess with how long each of the product stays in the eye and may um, cause some side effects for the patient. If you are using multiple medications at the time, it gets a little bit tricky, but you have to make sure that you space these out appropriately and you have to be really um, educational with patients because typically they want to do them all at once and get done with it. And if they're using multiple products, it may be a half an hour of total administration time, unfortunately, for them. But separating them out allows for the best medication practice. So if patients are using multiple drops, they need to wait at least five minutes between each of the drops. And then if they're using an eye drop and an eye ointment, they want to use the eye drop first and then wait 10 minutes between the eye drop and then the eye ointment. Patients should be instructed to never use a product if the color changes or if the solution becomes cloudy. And then you want to avoid touching the product directly to the eye. And just a piece of information for you, for patients use, you wait so long between using the drops and the ointment so that the ointment doesn't become a barrier to the drops penetration into the tear film or the cornea. And another little piece of information for patients is if the patient has trouble knowing if the eye drop actually entered into the eye surface, you can always have them refrigerate it before placing it into their eye and then that cool or cold sensation typically gives them a good indication of whether or not the eye drop made it into their eye. And that's again only for solutions. And then the last general counseling point is the lacrimal occlusion that I was mentioning earlier and we were discussing the eye structure. And that's where you block off the very corner part of your eye right next to the nose. And that allows for retention of the eye medication actually in the eye so that the patient gets the full treatment benefit and then minimization of any potential side effects for them. And then it's always important to know your exclusions to self-care. That's a huge part of ensuring appropriate therapy for patients and ensuring patient safety. These are kind of the general rules of thumb for exclusions to self-care, but as I mentioned before, always err on the more conservative side because this, these are ophthalmic conditions and it is a patient's eye, it's a patient's vision, so you always want to ensure that they get the appropriate care from an eye care provider and aren't risking any potential damage to their eye. So exclusions are going to be symptoms that last longer than 72 hours or 3 days. If the patient has any sensitivity to light, if there's been any chemical exposure to the eye. And then the big one that patients are probably going to be a little surprised about is history of contact lens wear. Any patient who uses contact lenses is automatically an exclusion to self-care. Now if they go to their eye doctor and they have dry eye and then drop, the doctor refers them to the pharmacy for a product, you can help them select a product. But if they're someone just coming in to your pharmacy, their contact lens wear, and haven't seen their eye doctor in six months, a year, something like that, you always want to refer, refer them back to their doctor. Eye exposure to heat, and that includes sun exposure as an exclusion, blunt trauma to the eye, or blurred vision. And that's blurred vision that's not associated with the use of ophthalmic ointments. And many common conditions that cause ocular discomfort are minor and self-limiting. However, relatively minor symptoms may be severe, associated with severe and potentially vision-threatening conditions, which is why you always want to err on the side of referral to a healthcare provider that's well-versed in eye anatomy and physiology. So now that we've covered kind of the basics of eye care and exclusions to self-care, we'll start moving into individual eye treatment and eye conditions. So the way that I've structured the lecture is we'll discuss each of the eye conditions separately, discuss how the condition will present some of the key facts for treating that condition, and we'll also discuss both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatment options for each eye condition. The first time that a pharmacologic product comes up, we'll discuss administration, potential side effects, indications, and all those pieces and parts, but as you may be able to guess, some of these eye products will overlap between different conditions, and so if they appear again for different conditions, I'll mention the place in therapy and kind of the indication, but we won't get into all the nitty-gritty details again for each of the products. So the first condition that we're going to discuss is dry eye, and that's 
most likely going to be the most common condition that you would see in the community setting. I myself have never had a patient who has approached me for an eye care recommendation. However, my husband is a chronic dry eye sufferer, so I've seen a lot of these products in my household and have a lot of experience with them from that. So dry eye is a condition that results from ineffective wetting of the corneal surface or a premature evaporation of the tear film and is among the most common disorders affecting the anterior eye and surprisingly it's commonly associated with postmenopausal women and that's related to some of the hormone changes that occur during menopause. Some other causes are going to be aging and certain chronic disease states such as rheumatoid arthritis, Bell's palsy, and thyroid eye disease. Environmental conditions and allergens are also going to be a huge cause of dry eye and that can include things like dust or heating and cooling systems. Medications are also a huge cause of dry eye and some of the more common ones are listed here. Anticholinergics are a huge player in dry eye. Beta blockers are as well and then diuretics and decongestants can also result in dry eye. And some of these medications are available in ophthalmic preparations and are going to be more likely to cause dry eye, but medications even that are orally administered can cause dry eye commonly, and that's a huge role for pharmacists to try and pinpoint those potential causes when you have a patient come in who's suffering from dry eye and trying to consider all the pieces and parts versus just recommending another medication for them. Refractive surgery patients can also experience dry eye, and they can experience it for weeks to months after the procedure. And contrary to what the name dry eye suggests, it often initially will present with excessive tearing and failing to properly diagnose this condition can lead to severe damage to eye tissues, especially the cornea. So whenever we're talking about these ophthalmic conditions, we're not really playing around. Even if you treat them with self-care, it's important to have monitoring parameters in place for that patient to either follow up with you or if they're using that product for a certain amount of time and it's not improving, to then follow up with their eye care provider. Additional symptoms for dry eye can be white or mildly red eye, also a sandy or gritting feeling or the sensation of something being in the eye, and then photophobia or sensitivity to light, burning and stinging, itching, dryness, and even just the eye fatigue or tiredness of the eye can occur commonly. And this is commonly a vicious cycle where the abnormalities in the tear layer cause a decreased lubrication, which then cause inadequate tear function, and so dry it kind of continually perpetuates itself. Now we'll move into a treatment approach for dry eye, and as I mentioned, failure to properly diagnose or treat this can cause severe damage for patients. So you really want to help them get appropriate treatment and get appropriate treatment quickly. There's kind of two facets to your treatment goals for patients. The first is just kind of focusing on how the patient feels. So you want to alleviate and control the dryness of the ocular surface, and you also just want to relieve the irritating symptoms. You just want to make it go away, essentially, for the patient. And then the second component is kind of more long-term. You want to prevent tissue and corneal damage so the patient doesn't have a long-term vision decline or vision inhibition because of this. Your treatment is primarily going to be focused on ocular lubricants, so kind of those eye ointments or just a wetting drop, which we'll discuss here in a second. But additional options that you can take with the patient are educating them about potential triggers and trying to avoid those, environmental modifications, eyelid therapy, and also omega-3 supplements. There's some evidence that's starting to come out about omega-3 and flaxseed oil supplements and potential benefit that those offer to dry eye treatment for patients. So moving into pharmacologic therapy, your first treatment option is going to be artificial tears. And there are several different products that are on the market that fall under this classification. And how these work or their mechanism of action is to maintain a normal conjunctival and corneal surface for the patient. So essentially they're just lubricating the surface, serving as the name implies, as a tear to keep the surface wet and kind of keep objects moving off of the eye surface that couldn't be there. Some common ingredients that you're going to see are polyvinyl alcohol, carboxymethylcellulose, and hydroxypropylmethylcellulose and povidine. 
You'll also commonly see preservatives in these products and organic electrolytes that maintain a pH similar to the eye and then water soluble polymetric systems. And these products are available in various degrees of viscosity and we'll discuss why that varying degree of viscosity is important but generally patients start on a lower viscosity and will move upward depending on their system symptoms. These products are generally going to be used for about one to two days and they're commonly used first thing in the morning or before bedtime and that's just based on when the patient's symptoms are more severe. So some patients they want to use them in the morning start the day off immediately with the medication to help prevent the dry eye from even getting started. Whereas some patients have symptoms later in the day or using them before bedtime helps to keep the eye surface well moisturized during sleep, which is when they may typically have the most severe symptoms. So these products are available with or without preservatives and typical preservatives are listed here on the slide for you. And increased usage has an increased risk of toxicity due to these preservatives. So that's something you want to watch with your patient and ask them how much they're going to anticipate using these, or these products, how often they're having symptoms. And that increase in use means multiple times per day they're using the eye product and putting that preservative into their eye. And the more and more they have that preservative in their eye, they have a higher risk of toxicity from those preservatives. Your caveat though is products without preservatives may be less irritating, uh, but they require specialized storage and administration. And patients should be aware and typically aren't aware that these non-preserved products are generally recommended to be discarded immediately after being opened and used or discarded within a very short amount of time, such as a day to a few days. And that's because if there's not a preservative there, there's nothing to prevent bacterial growth once that product is opened. And most of these products do have some sort of a water component to give them some flow, which water is then automatically at risk for bacterial growth. There also are some products that are coming out that have less toxic or disappearing preservative formulations such as Purite, and those are products that you would want to consider recommending for your high, utilize, high utilizers or patients with severe symptoms. There's also a newer product that just came out called Refresh Dry Eye Therapy, which is an oil and water emulsion, and that provides lubrication for a more prolonged period, and that's because the water, or the oil and water emulsion is believed to supplement the lipid component of the tear film. And so by providing a longer benefit time, the patient's using it less and then has less risk for any of those side effects from the preservative agents. The last pharmacologic therapy that's available for dry eye treatment includes non-medicated eye ointments or bland ointments. So they don't really have any medication in them. They're essentially just an ointment with a few additional items to help incorporate it into the eye, but no active drug that's treating the eye condition. Generally, your primary ingredients are going to be white petrolatum, mineral oil, and lanolin. And that mineral oil helps the ointment to melt at the body temperature of the eye. The white petrolatum is just providing lubrication benefit. And then the lanolin helps to incorporate those water-soluble medications and then prevents any evaporation. So if a patient was using something else in addition to the bland ointment, that lanolin is going to help to incorporate it. Again, preservative-free ointments are recommended for long-term use, and the advantage of these over your eye drops or artificial tears is that they have an en enhanced retention time in the eye. So they're going to stay in the eye longer and they're going to provide symptomatic benefit longer. They can be used as much or as little throughout the day as a patient wants based on their symptoms, but they're typically administered twice a day with many patients just using them at bedtime, and that's due to the side effect of blurry vision that occurs with all ointments. You can also see some of these bland ointments having vitamin A or omega-3 supplements added into them. And the last thing that we'll talk about is non-pharmacologic therapy to wrap up. So these are just some general recommendations for patients to avoid dry or dusty places, 
to use humidifiers to help keep moisture in the air and prevent um, tear evaporation from their eyes. Moving their workstations away from heating and cooling vents if that's a trigger for them. Also decreasing the time that they spend viewing at computer screens. Wearing eye protection in windier outdoor environments and then the use of cold compresses. And then in more severe cases, healthcare providers can actually use plugs that provide occlusion of that lacrimal drainal system to increase the available tear pool for the patient and increase wetting capability of the tears. This just covers a basic treatment approach and this com came from an abbreviated version of a modified Delphi technique to obtain a consensus amongst various eye care providers on the treatment of dry eye disease. So this is just a very basic level and isn't really that important to you beyond severity level one and two. Severity level one and two are really the only treatment steps that you should be treating at a self-care level and actually primarily focusing on severity level one. Once a patient gets into that severity level two, you should be focusing more on referral to a healthcare provider for them. And a simplified version of that structure can be seen here, and I apologize for the shifting of the text, but based on the patient's rating of discomfort, whether or not it's mild, moderate, or severe, is gonna change the recommendation that you make for that patient. So for your patients who have mild discomfort, you're gonna recommend a low viscosity artificial tear using just once or twice a day for about a week. If they're higher up into the moderate level, you're still gonna use a low viscosity, but they can administer that product three to four times a day. And if that lower viscosity product isn't working for them, you can switch them to a high viscosity formulation. And then for our patients with severe discomfort, you can help treat them with self-care recommendations, but you do still wanna refer these patients. So patients with severe discomfort because they're going to be using these products so much, you want to recommend a non-preserved artificial tear every hour and then also using that ophthalmic ointment that we were discussing, the bland ointments, at bedtime for one week. That covers everything for dry eye and at this time we'll move into conjunctivitis which will include both allergic and viral conjunctivitis. Allergic conjunctivitis is going to be the other eye condition that you're going to commonly see in the self-care arena. It's resulted from the inflammation of the conjunctiva due to a hypersensitivity reaction and it's virtually an endless list of antigens that can cause this ocular allergy and then resultant um, allergic reaction. Some of the more common causes are listed here, so obviously pollen, animal dander, and then topical eye preparations as well. And your common symptoms are going to be red eye with watery discharge. Your hallmark symptom is going to be ocular itching. And then vision may be blurred, but it's usually not blurred to a level where the patient has impaired vision. And that blurring typically comes from excessive tearing because the patient has such an allergic component going on that the eye is constantly tearing. And finally, patients may also have the sensation of a foreign body in their eyes, but they're obviously unable to find any type of a foreign body. In treatment approach for these patients, your goals are first primarily going to be focused on what you can do to remove or avoid that allergen. So your best therapy is trying to help the patient question about any potential factors, any potential allergens, anything that may help or may be associated with the onset of symptoms and help them pinpoint some of those allergens that are their triggers. You want to try and limit or reduce the severity of the allergic reaction, provide symptomatic relief through self-care treatment options, and help to protect the ocular surface to prevent any long-term damage for the patient. Non-pharmacologic therapy, as I alluded to, is trying to identify the offending substance and avoid that as much as possible. You can also use cold compresses three to four times a day, and those are gonna to help to reduce the redness and the itching of the eye tissue. And then avoidance of the allergic response. So trying to stop the chain of reaction before it starts. So if a patient has a certain pollen that they're allergic to, whether it's tree, ragweed, or grass, 
trying to check the pollen count so they know which season is worse and know which seasons they should try and minimize their time outside or maybe even pre-treat a little bit with antihistamine therapy, keeping doors and windows closed during those times, using air filters and changing those frequently, even running air conditioning are additional non-pharmacologic treatment options for patients. And for any of your contact lens wearers, they should not be worn during allergic conjunctivitis until the allergic reaction has been completely resolved for the patient. And looking at pharmacologic therapy for these patients, there's a lot more treatment options than there were for dry eyes. So again, artificial tears are a treatment option. And then we have some additional players that come in. Ophthalmic antihistamines and mast cell stabilizers are a treatment option. Ophthalmic antihistamines and decongestant combinations are a treatment option. You can also use ophthalmic decongestants alone, although those generally aren't recommended or highly recommended. And then your first line treatment is always going to be artificial tears, and that's because they have the least likelihood of side effects associated with them. But if the patient's symptoms persist, or maybe they've used artificial tears before and it hasn't worked for them, your next step is going to be switching the patient to an ophthalmic antihistamine and mast cell stabilizer. For the artificial tears, patients can use them as needed, as we previously discussed under dry eyes, and all of the same rules apply for those. Additional treatment options that aren't self-care but are um, under the same umbrella for this are oral antihistamines can be added for the patient if needed, which can be a self-care treatment option depending on which antihistamine, and then medical referral if your patient's symptoms do not resolve. So the first medication we're going to talk about under this classification for allergic conjunctivitis pharmacologic options is going to be our ophthalmic antihistamine and mast cell stabilizer. So once you move on from artificial tears into an active agent, this is going to be your first line therapy. And there's only one medication that falls under this class, and that's ketotiphen, 0.025%. And what this medication is, is it is a very potent H1 receptor antagonist that prevents the acute histamine-mediated allergy symptoms. And it also has a mast cell stabilizer, which inhibits the degranulation of your mast cells, which then prevents the release of late-phase mediators. And this medication can act very quickly. Once a patient uses it, it can provide benefit to them within a few minutes and lasts up to about 12 hours or so. So it's a very good medication, both for long-term symptom relief and quick action for patients when they have kind of a flare-up of symptoms. Brand names for this medication are Zadiator, Aloe, Zyrtec, Itchii, and Claritin I. And as I've mentioned before, always go out into your OTC aisle and actually grab the box and look at what your active ingredient is to make sure that you're recommending what you think you're recommending to your patient. The reason that this is going to be our first line therapy for allergic conjunctivitis when we're using active ingredient drugs is that it's safe for use all the way down into three years. So all of our other medications are limited to patients who are six years and older. So this goes into our youngest patient population and has the less risk of severe side effects compared to some of the other treatment options. Your dose is going to be one drop twice daily Patients can use it every 8 to 12 hours, and this medication they can use beyond 72 hours, which is kind of unique for a lot of our self-care treatment options for eye conditions. Side effects that can occur with this are burning, stinging, and dry eyes, just typically associated with administration of the medication, and are generally not very severe. And this is going to be your safest treatment option in patients who have diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. As I mentioned, the other treatment options typically involve a decongestant, which have some side effects that you really want to try and avoid in those patients. And this is the only product on the market for allergic conjunctivitis that doesn't have a decongestant. And it's our primary therapy in patients because it's the safest and most effective therapy that we have available on the OTC market. And it's been one of the largest improvement seen on the OTC market for allergic treatment in many years. Moving into our next treatment option is ophthalmic antihistamines. 
and formulation options include phenyramine and antizoline, but both of these also contain nafazoline, which is a decongestant. So while ophthalmic antihistamines are a good treatment option in and of themselves, they're not available on the OTC market as standalone and commonly have a decongestant available with them, which kind of brings in some of the limitation of their use. Brand names for these medications include Visine A, Nafcon A, Opcon A, and Vasicon A. And these medications are, again, histamine 1 antagonists and are effective alone. However, part of the reason that they're available as combination products is because Studies have shown them to be more effective than either agent alone, so the combination of an antihistamine and decongestant works better than either the antihistamine or the decongestant when they're just by themselves. Their indication is for rapid relief of atopic conjunctivitis, and again these are limited to patients who are six years and above. So that's one of the most important things to know about your OTC products is what ages you can safely use them in. The dose for these are going to be one to two drops, up to four times a day, depending on the patient's symptom severity. Generally, you don't want them using them four times a day if they can get away with using them one or two times a day, just depending on how severe their symptoms are and what time of the day their symptoms are. These, however, do have a maximum of 72 hours of use, and that comes in because of the decongestant component of these medications. Side effects for these medications are generally, again, related to the decongestant component, and those are anticholinergic properties and pupil dilation. It can also have some burning, some stinging, and some itching. And that dilation is most common in patients who have white-colored irises, so blue eyes, green eyes, or patients who may have a compromised cornea, such as contact lens wear. So those are patients you really want to warn them about the potential for pupil dilation and potential vision issues they may have with that. And then these are contraindicated in patients who have a known risk for ang angle closure gla glaucoma. And that's because of that dilation then resulting in the angle closure glaucoma, which is fairly severe. Additional precautions for these medications are you want to use them cautiously in patients who may have difficulty urinating or have an enlarged prostate and also, again, removing contacts before patients administer these medications and then keeping them out for quite some time afterwards. Moving on into ophthalmic decongestants, we sort of covered these in our ophthalmic antihistamines since they're only available in a combination product, but the drugs that are specifically decongestant agents are phenylephrine, nafazoline, tetrahydrazoline, and oxymetazoline. And then the brand names are listed below. Commonly, you'll see eye relief or NAFCON, clear eyes, but you need to be careful with those products and even the Visine products because they have so many different products that agents commonly vary greatly in these medications. Generally, you're going to prefer other agents compared to these, and that's just because of the side effect of these medications and not having a dual benefit as your antihistamine and decongestant combinations do. These again are limited to patients who are six years and older. And your dose is going to be one to two drops every four to six hours. But you always want to look at your packaging because it can vary significantly based on your product. And again, you're limited to a maximum of 72 hours for use of these medications. And that's related to their mechanism of action. So these medications are going to primarily act on alpha adrenergic receptors and the ophthalmic vasculature resulting in constriction, so they're agonist, and that then reduces eye redness, can also help with burning, tearing, and itching. But if you use that beyond 72 hours because of that mechanism, your eye can become dependent on that constriction from the medication, and then without the medication, you can have rebound conjunctival hyperemia or redness you can also have allergic conjunctivitis or allergic blepharitis that result from rebound of not using that medication and then the eye becomes dependent on it. When you are looking at these medications, some of the medications are better to use than some of the other ones. So nafazoline and tetrahydrazoline typically have less side effects associated with them than phenylephrine and oxymetazoline do. 
And a little caveat for these medications, as I alluded to, there's a maximum use of 72 hours for these. However, if your patient, for whatever reason, has symptoms that worsen, you want to refer them sooner than that 72 hours. While these medications generally don't have a lot of ocular systemic side effects, you do want to be careful in using them, especially in patients who are, are you're treating a child or patients who have children at home because ingestion of these products can result in coronary emergencies and death. So if you have a six-year-old patient, an eight-year-old patient using those, you always want to make sure you counsel the parent about keeping it away from anywhere that the child could reach. And if it's a parent using it, making sure that it's kept away as well. General side effects for these include rebound congestion that we've mentioned, burning and stinging, discomfort, and again, your anticholinergic properties or pupil dilation. And then dry eye can result from prolonged use beyond that 72 hour window that is the maximum of use. And that's again related to the eye becoming dependent on that constriction from the drug and then dry eye results when the patient isn't using it or is using it too much. Contraindications for this medication is again, narrow angle closure glaucoma. And then there are some patients that it's not automatically contraindicated in, but you wanna use it cautiously due to the vasculature effect of this medication, and that includes patients with hypertension, arteriosclerosis, diabetes, and then pregnancy as well. And storage is really important for these medications. Storing them at high temperature may result in an increase in ocular reactions and even more severe dilation of the eye whenever the patient instills it. So we always wanna make sure that they stored at room temperature or a place that's kind of cooler and darker so that the temperature doesn't get into the area that these side effects are going to result from. And finally, we'll wrap up with some alternative or homeopathic treatment options for allergic conjunctivitis. And this product is made by Simosalan, which is an eye care company that has various homeopathic remedies for a wide variety of eye conditions and we'll discuss one of their other products here shortly. And so the one that specifically is used for allergic eye relief is Simosalan Eye Drops Number 2, and this is indicated for relief from itching and burning that's caused by allergic reactions. And it has three active ingredients that are all homeopathic ingredients, which include apis, euphrasia, and sabadilla, which are all listed as six times, which I'm not entirely sure what that six times means but you know that they have an equal concentration of these ingredients. We'll now move into viral conjunctivitis, which is commonly known as pink eye, and is usually a self-limiting condition, but is highly contagious. And this is your most common form of conjunctivitis. Typically, if symptoms don't worsen or um, aren't extremely severe, a patient can treat them by themselves and symptoms will typically improve in one to three weeks. But if symptoms worsen or aren't improving with potential therapy options or even some of the non-pharmacologic options after three days, you want to refer these patients to a healthcare provider. Signs and symptoms can vary depending on the severity. So a patient may get all of these signs and symptoms or they may just get some of the redness. So patients will obviously have pink or red eyes lending to the pink eye name, and they typically have a surrounding crust around the eye. Patients will have a watery discharge and then sensation of an object in the eye. They'll typically have blurry vision resulting from that watery discharge, and sometimes they can have a low-grade fever or swollen lip nodes resulting from the viral infection. Most patients just have to wait it out. However, sometimes a prescriber will give them an antibiotic drop to prevent bacterial conjunctivitis resulting, and so that's why you wanna consider referring the patient if their symptoms aren't um, improving around that three-day mark or so. And the most important thing is just focusing on prevention of future cases for patients. So instructing them on no sharing of towels, no sharing of pillows, or anything else that could come in contact with the eyes avoiding rubbing their eyes and then touching other parts of their body, shaking hands, etc. But you should really refer these patients. The textbook does say to refer these patients 
but use your professional judgment for these patients. You can recommend artificial tears for them or an ophthalmic decongestant to help decrease some of that watery discharge and blurry vision. And you can also recommend non-pharmacologic options for them, so cold compresses three to four times a day, again, to just help with some of that redness and swelling and itching. The next eye condition that we'll move into discussing is corneal edema, and this is a very severe eye condition that an eye care provider must diagnose before you ever make a recommendation for treatment for the patient. Following that eye care visit, though, you can help the patient treat with hyperosmotic agents. And this condition results from fluid accumulation, and as you can see here by the pictures, the edemous area of the cornea is typically underneath that blue line there. And those endothelial cells then start to become damaged and start to separate out. And then that um, fluid is no longer retained where it's normally supposed to be and starts to move out and starts to cause the swelling and leaks out. And the key that you're going to need to know about this is knowing when the patient needs to be referred and what some of the symptoms are for referring these patients. Causes for this are commonly going to be overwear of contact lenses. So patients who don't take their contact lenses out beyond the limitation of use, patients who don't wash their contact lenses, who sleep with their contact lenses in, etc. Patients who may have had some sort of a damage to their cornea, and then any patients with inherited corneal dystrophies. Additional symptoms of these medications can include halos or starbursts around lights, and so that's going to be how you know when you need to refer a patient to their eye care doctor. And this can occur with or without reduced vision. So the patients may just notice an occasional halo, but they don't have any type of additional vision reduction, and those patients should still be referred to their eye care provider. Again, once the patient has been diagnosed by their eye care provider, there are pharmacologic OTC options that you can recommend for these patients. And these are hyperosmotic ingredients, or hyperosmotic agents. And the ingredients in these are going to be hypertonic saline, which saline is sodium chloride, and the concentration is going to vary based on what type of a product it is. So ointments have a higher concentration at 5% and the solution has a lower concentration at 2%. The ointment is going to be your more effective treatment option, but because it has that higher concentration, it typically causes more stinging and burning. And so patients who need to use this for long term typically prefer use of the solution because of those side effects. How this medication works is it increases the tonicity of the tear film which allows an increased movement of fluid from the cornea to the more highly osmotic tear film. And that allows for normal tear flow mechanisms to remove that excess fluid to decrease the swelling and then revert the vision back to normal. Side effects for this medication is typically minimal. Again, burning and stinging is primarily all you're going to see, and that's associated more so with the ointment from the higher concentration of the saline. Application is going to vary based on what product the patient is using. If the patient is using the solution, they're going to use one or two drops every three to four hours, and typically you want to have them use it within the first few hours of waking up in the morning, and that's because the edema of the cornea is typically worse when the patient wakes up, and so that helps them to kind of get ahead of the side effects that the condition causes. For patients who decide to use the ointment, you typically want to use it at bedtime and that's because it's longer acting and then it minimizes any blurred vision that may result from using an ointment. The only contraindication to use of this medication is a damaged corneal epithelium and that's because the corneal epithelium permits a limited permeability for inorganic ions which would be your hypertonic saline. And when it's damaged, there's an increased penetration, which reduces the osmotic effects. So the medication doesn't really help to pull off that fluid as much as it should. And then an important counseling point, for whatever reason, I've noticed in my experience that anytime you recommend saline, whether it's for eye treatment, if it's for wound treatment, patients always want to make it themselves because they're like, oh, it's just salt water. 
but patients never want to use homemade saline solutions due to the risk of infection and also it's hard for them to produce a 5% or a 2% saline so they may produce a 20% saline and then have some pretty severe osmotic effect that's going to cause some pretty severe eye damage for them. We'll now move on into the condition known as sty, and sty actually has a few different names associated with it. It can also be referred to as hordulium, which is generally the same thing as a sty, but is generally a little bit more on the inside of the eyelid. And shazalia is another common condition that's similar to a sty, but isn't exactly the same, and it's an enlarged blocked oil gland in the eyelid. So all these kind of are similar and present the same way and so it's kind of one of the reasons that you want to generally err on the side of referring for a patient who has an eye condition. So a sty is a bacterial infection that's typically caused by staphylococcal bacteria and it's going to be found near the root of an eyelash. So as you can see in the picture right on the inner area of the eyelid by your eyelashes. And it results typically from bacteria coming from the nose. So someone wipes their nose, doesn't really realize it, and transfers the bacteria up then to their eye. And it can have various causes, generally something that has some leftover bacteria on it. So it can result from females who leave eye makeup on overnight. So a critical way to prevent this is using an eye wash every night. Use of either old or expired cosmetics Generally, the rule of thumb is any type of eye cosmetics you want to change every six months, not disinfecting contents, contacts prior to insertion, and then changing contacts without good hand hygiene. So you always want to wash your hands, dry them before changing any contacts. Symptoms for these, for this condition, typically includes just a painful red swollen lump. It doesn't impact the vision so much as just having that painful swollen lump. And the most important thing for patients to know is that they never want to pop a sty. It has a pimple-like appearance, and it's commonly, or it's a common thing for patients to want to pop it, but they kind of have to let it ride its course. Treatment for this condition is limited to symptomatic relief, and there's some pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic options that can be used. You're not going to use any of your standard OTC eye products for treating sty. However, you can use this um, homeopathic treatment option, again a simosalin product, or simply a lubricant eye ointment. For your simosalin sty eye relief, again it's all homeopathic agents that you can see listed here. And the issue with this is that it doesn't have established efficacy and it even warns on the product that the initial exacerbation of symptoms may occur. So you really want to cautiously recommend this product to patients and they need to discard it after 30 days of opening standardly to all of your eye care products. If a patient does decide to use this though, they can use two to three drops three to four times a day. However, I would err more on the side of recommending non-pharmacologic treatment options for these patients. So the use of warm compresses which is different from some of our other eye conditions. For a you always want to use warm to kind of help that swelling decrease and help the infection resolve. And patients want to use that for 10 minutes, four times a day. Again, patients don't want to wear contacts until the symptoms resolve, and then prevention is not rubbing eyes so that they're not spreading that bacteria further. And prevention is, again, going to be your primary focus with this, similar to your viral conjunctivitis. Additional things that you can do is to avoid sharing of pillowcases, bed sheets, washcloths, or towels, and then also washing your washcloths and towels after every use while the patient has a sty. The next eye condition that we'll discuss is blepharitis, and blepharitis is an external inflammatory condition which results with an accumulation of debris along the eyelid margin. So sort of a crust, as you can see in this picture, that is from the infection. It's typically associated with Staphylococcus epididymis, Staphylococcus aureus, or Seborrheic dermatitis. And this results in a red, scaly, thickened island. And sometimes it can even cause a loss of eyelids for those patients. 
Your most common symptom is going to be crusting of the eyelids upon wakening, and it may even be severe enough where the patient may have trouble opening their eye initially in the morning. And additional symptoms can include itching and burning. Treatment for this is primarily, again, going to focus on our non-pharmacologic therapy. Again, you want to use warm compresses for this, and you can use those for 15 to 20 minutes, two to four times a day. And lid scrubs are also starting to become commercially available from patients. However, a patient can also make this themselves, um, sort of an at-home formula, by using a No More Tears baby shampoo. And that's done by using a fourth of a, ta or a fourth of a teaspoon of shampoo mixed with one cup of water, and then gently using that to rinse the eyelids and eyelashes. For patients that do use lid scrubs, you're going to apply the lid scrub to a cotton swab or a gauze pad, and you always want to make sure that the patient uses a different applicator for each eye so that there's no continual spread of infection if one eye heals before the other. And the patient's going to rinse their eyelids and eyelashes with this lid scrub. Pharmacologic treatment options for blepharitis is primarily going to be focused on ocular lubricants, and that's only if eye irritation is present. If the patient mainly just has the crusting and doesn't have true irritation of the eye tissue, you primarily just want to recommend a warm compress or a lid scrub. And you always want to refer these patients to a physician for proper evaluation if their symptoms fail to improve. If it's just a one or two day thing, they may be able to get away with treating it um, at home using self-care products and just that lid scrub. The next eye condition that we will discuss and is our last eye condition actually is macular degeneration. And this is an age-related disorder that is the leading cause of blindness in the United States. And there's two types of macular degeneration that can occur. The first is atrophic or dry, and this results in a blurred central vision. And this is the most common form of macular degeneration, and it occurs in about 90% of people with the condition. So their early vision notice or um, signal that they may have macular degeneration is going to be the occurrence of blurred vision. The other type of macular degeneration is neovascular or wet, and so that just results in loss of central vision, which can be seen in that second picture. They start to lose any vision at all beyond it just being blurred. This affects about 10 people who have macular degeneration and is more severe than the dry form in its early onset, can look wavy, and the vision loss for these, patient, or these patients occurs very, very quickly. For macular degeneration, there's not really a lot that you can do to cure this for the patient. There's not any sort of eye drop or ophthalmic preparation that's going to resolve the symptoms or delay the symptoms. But there are a few um, vitamins or supplements that are starting to come out that are aimed at slowing the rate of progression and the extent of visual loss, which were alluded to in the pre-readings that you did for this lecture. And those commonly include antioxidants and then zinc as well. As you can see here, there's a whole variety of vitamins that are on the market for macular degeneration, which should have been discussed a little bit in Dr. Alexander's lecture for you. And typically, these vitamins that are targeted for macular degeneration came from the ARIDS and ARIDS-2 studies, which have shown benefit for certain vitamins in vision prevention or vision retention. Some additional eye care considerations for you are treatment of just a loose foreign substance for the patient. The patient's going to notice an immediate response of tearing, and then self-treatment is generally going to be appropriate for these patients if it's minor and there's no abrasion, so there's no cut that you can see or that the patient has noticed. If the patient suspects foreign substances of wood or metal fragments, however, they should be treated promptly by their eye care provider for the potential for a cut or penetrating injury that can cause some long-term vision impact for these patients. You also want to refer a patient if they have continuous eye pain, changes in vision, or continued redness or irritation of the eye. If a patient doesn't have any of those conditions, though, there are sterile saline or ocular irrigants that you can use if 
reflex tearing and kind of pulling at the eyelid does not remove the foreign substance for the patient. And those include Bosch and Lom eye wash and Corelium for fresh eyes. However, you do not want to use these products for open wounds in or near the eyes. Chemical burns are also important for you to be able to properly triage and counsel your patients on. However, you should not treat them over the counter or with over the counter products. These are considered ophthalmic emergencies and you should immediately refer your patient. You want to use copious irrigation for this with sterile water or tap water. And you want to irrigate with tap water only if saline is unavailable. Saline is going to be your preferred agent. However, you do want the patient to continually irrigate the eye until the eye care provider can be seen or until they can be seen at an emergency department. So tap water is better than nothing and is really crucial for preventing long-term damage or minimizing long-term damage for these patients. Key points are you want to recommend products only when patient experiences minor pain or discomfort. And again, when you're in doubt, always refer a patient. It's their vision and you don't want to make any missed call or misjudgment that may impact their long-term vision. You always want to consult the eye care practitioner if the patient is utilizing other ophthalmic products. And your first line therapy should always be non-pharmacologic counseling. And it's really important to always counsel your patients on appropriate use of an eye care product if you do recommend an eye care product such as an ophthalmic antihistamine with a decongestant or your mast cell stabilizer and antihistamine. And it's especially important to counsel them on appropriate application of the product, especially the nasal lacrimal occlusion to prevent systemic side effects. And then just to wrap up, we're going to cover a few components of contact, contact lens care. There are several million Americans, obviously, who use contact lens care, and many of these Americans or patients don't know how to properly care for their contacts in order to prevent side effects, which may overlap with some of the ophthalmic conditions that we just discussed. So for contact lenses, there's two major categories, the first being soft or hydrophilic, and then the second is rigid or gas permeable, which th these have been referred to in the past as hard, but sort of have a negative connotation and each of them have their own benefits and are good options for patients depending on what some of their vision limitations are. Some general lens care recommendations for patients are to always wash their hands and to rinse them thoroughly before handling and caring for their lenses, which may seem like common sense, but I'm sure if you're someone who uses contact lenses, sometimes you get in a rush, you're ready for bed, you need to get the lenses out for something, and you may forget to rinse your hands. Each time the lenses are removed, they should be cleaned, rinsed, and disinfected before wearing again. And then patients should gently rub both surfaces of the contact lenses, rinse them thoroughly, and then soak overnight in the recommended solution. And then when cleaning contact lenses, only use what has been recommended by the prescribing eye care provider. Patients should not change what product they're using without first discussing with their eye care provider. For soft lenses, there's a lot of different advantages for these. They are um, excellent for initial lens comfort and are easier for patients who are just starting out on contact lenses compared to the rigid lenses. They're well suited for intermittent wearing and they're very easy to fit and to care for and they're unlikely to either trap material or fall out. Some disadvantages seen with these products is that not all patients are going to get very good visual acuity or an increase in their vision with these products. They're more prone to complications and more prone to causing some of our ophthalmic conditions that we were discussing, especially because of um, hypoxia or a decrease in oxygenation to the eye. They're more likely to cause that than our rigid lenses. And then they're very fragile during handling and cleaning, so it's very easy for someone to rip one of these soft lenses and then have to replace them quite frequently. For our rigid or GP glass, gas permeable lenses, some advantages is that they're excellent optics for optimal visual, vision acuity. So these are going to give patients the best vision, even over um, glasses. They can be used for nearly all forms of vision problems. They're much more affordable for patients long term. And then they have a lower incidence of infection or inflammation complications. Some disadvantages are that they're much more difficult for patients to get used to initially. 
They may trap foreign material beneath the lens, and then they're much more difficult to fit, so you really need to have a good eye care provider for these. And then there is a flare that may be noticed at night, especially if a patient has large pupils. Some general counseling points for contact lenses is to only change brands or products if instructed by the eye care provider. You never want to top off the storage solution in a case after the solution has been used. You always want to replace the solutions after each use. If a product has been open for 30 days, you want to discard it. And that 30 day mark is from the first time that it opens and your expiration date is no longer valid once a product has been open. You should clean your contact lens case daily and you should replace it every three months to minimize any risk of infection. Patients who use contacts should avoid any type of water activities, so swimming, hot tubs, or showering while wearing their contacts. It's generally recommended that they always remove or insert the same lens first to avoid losing a lens or avoid placing the right um, lens in the left case, etc. And then you never want to use contact lenses if there's any sort of eye irritation or redness currently going on. Some precautions for contact lenses are um, related to adverse effects of drugs. So always try and get to know your patients, know if they are contact lens users, because that can help you identify some important counseling points. And that's beyond just your ophthalmic drug products. It can happen with orally administered products. and then. Soft contacts can create a sustained release mechanism, so it's really important that patients never place their contacts in immediately after using any type of eye drop or eye ointment. Patients who may use cosmetics should be careful. They should always put the lenses in prior to applying makeup, and generally aqueous-based products are preferred over oil-based. There are still risks with these products for decrease oxygenation to the cornea and edema even when they're properly fitted, so it's really important to have an annual checkup with an eye care provider. And any time a patient has a corneal abrasion, they want to give their eye a break from the contacts and leave them out for at least two to th seven days and then slowly breaking them back in and wear them every few days and every other day and gradually working back up to the frequency that they typically wear them. So I thank you all for bearing with me through the cornucopia of ophthalmic conditions. I know it's a lot of information and kind of jumped around a lot, but I wanted to give you a good grasp of the various conditions that you may see in the community settings so that you can properly triage and make appropriate recommendations for patients. But please feel free to either stop by my office or email me if there's anything that wasn't clear since I wasn't in class to give this lecture and there's anything that you want to follow up on.